And I came to realize that so many of the like chronic and mysterious health symptoms that I had had for most of my twenties and thirties that couldn't be explained in lab work, couldn't be explained sure. by a doctor, couldn't really be diagnosed as this or that, but they're always there. Um, I, I was like, it's, it's the autonomic nervous system. Like that's the thing that connects mm -hmm. everything together. And all of these chronic and mysterious symptoms that aren't diagnosable as any one specific thing are the red flags that my body is giving me to let me know that my nervous system is not in a good regulated, safe state. Sure. So that's when the like nervous system hacking began. And I'm very, very <clears throat> much a believer in the bottom up approaches. So that's like the somatic experiencing, mm -hmm. shaking, um, dancing, embodiment, um, body work, um, like all the, the breath work, all the bottom up stuff. Welcome to the Permission to Heal podcast. I am Marcy Brockman. Together we will discover what brings us healing, meaning, and true joy. You only need your own permission to begin. Welcome to Permission to Heal. I am Marcy Brockman and I am really thrilled that you are here. Today I have a wonderful conversation to share with you with a very inspiring woman named Lindsay Lockett. Lindsay Lockett is a trauma educator, a coach, and the host of a podcast called Holistic Trauma Healing. In 2018, after deconstructing from the dogmas of fundamentalist religion and toxic wellness culture, Lindsay experienced her own dark night of the soul. During the healing journey that followed, she realized that trauma affects us as whole people, and therefore we need to heal as whole people. Although Lindsay has benefited tremendously from her therapy and psychiatry, these modalities never totally resonated with her because she found they forced her to fragment herself rather than heal holistically. She set out to find an affordable and accessible approach that integrates the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, and ancestral parts of our being and discovered the magic of the nervous system. Now she blends consciousness and spirituality with the nervous system to work to help transform our lives. Lindsay lives in northeastern Minnesota, in a very rural, beautiful part of Minnesota, with her partner of 20 years, two teenagers, and two dogs. She enjoys cooking with friends, spending time in the woods, foraging for food and plant medicine, and cold plunging in Lake Superior. It was very interesting having a conversation with her. We talked about her roots and fundamental Christianity, um, and we talked about how she and her husband broke away from that and discovered their own paths to finding their own joy and their own paths to um, discovering their own authentic individuality and their own cosmology and rebuilt themselves, rebuilt for themselves a, a beautiful, fulfilled, meaningful life. Uh, Lindsay uh, talked, we talked a lot about hacking our autonomic nervous system and how that is the connection between our brain and our bodies and um and really the the clue to the whole body and the whole mind healing from from trauma and experiences that have rocked our world and and so on um neuro neuroplasticity and the limbic system and uh and and a whole lot of books that um she felt found were foundational to her her own growth and her own knowledge and, and so on. So I, I hope you enjoy this conversation. We had a really great time and um, I think we became friends, which is super great. Um, so here's the conversation with Lindsay Lockett. And if you really like what you've heard, as I'm sure you will, please like, please subscribe, please leave us a, a five-star rating, please uh, consider leaving us a review, please share with your friends and family um, please share it on social media and tag me in it. And, um, and please go forth in your life, realizing that you have the permission to create the life of joy, meaning, connection, abundance, and fabulousness that you so richly deserve. It's all up to you. You only need your own permission to begin. Thanks very much for being here. I really appreciate you.
screw it up. So Okay, so um, I do all the editing myself, all that stuff. So whatever we want to cut, whatever we don't want to cut, it's totally fine. If you have to get up to pee, you know, just tell me. Excellent. We'll and Good. Come back. Really super <laughs> flexible. Um, I do the intros after. So we're just going to, when we're both ready, we'll just begin and launch into the conversation. Generally, toward the beginning of the interview, I like to do the six quick questions, which you, which you had seen many moons ago when you did the... <laughs> Yeah, no, the, I already forgot about them. <laughs> totally no, I already fine. forgot them. They're, they're better to be spontaneous anyway. Okay, it doesn't good. matter. There's no wrong answer. Yeah, we'll see how my answers compare. Yeah. Um, this is going to be early on in the second season, which will air starting January 12th. Okay. So it'll be somewhere in probably late January. That's okay. I have podcasts that I recorded this year that aren't going to be published until like March of next year. So oh, well, I'm really, you know. I'm like pretty behind and stacked right now. <laughs> well, but that's good. Uh, yeah, it is. And it isn't. I mean, I'm a one woman show too. And yeah. my podcast doesn't make me any money. My coaching no, is what makes me either. money. So I've been pouring all of my energy and time into coaching and the podcast has been on the back burner. So, well, as it should be. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I've been trying the affiliate marketing thing, but my commercials really suck. And so oh. that's not going anywhere. I, I just have had no practice and I don't know what the hell I'm doing. So yeah, I'm um, going to just lower my desk really fast. It has a crank and it lowers so that I can sit down. Oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah. You were standing I mean, this whole time? Yeah, I've been standing this whole time. Why? Because <laughs> I like... <laughs> Pelvic floor issues. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, not really. Um, yeah, I just don't. I have to change positions a lot. I get uncomfortable really fast. So now I'm sitting. I would never do an interview standing. I, I have been interviewed by a bunch of people and have interviewed a bunch of people who wanted to stand the whole time because they felt he kept their energy up. And I'm like, it's just uncomfortable. Oh, I'd be it shuffling. It has nothing to do. It has nothing to do with energy for me. It's just like, I just get uncomfortable. So I stand, I sit. Yeah, I work whatever. in, I work in shoes, even though I'm in my house. Because you like <laughs> shoes? Um, I just feel more comfortable. Like my feet and my back feel more comfortable when I wear shoes. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm, apparently this is not a problem that happens when you get older. <laughs> Cause you're like, Hmm, this is interesting. <laughs> no, I, I just like, I like to hear about people's different behaviors and habits and and predilections yeah. and stuff i think it's yeah. interesting the minute i come home my shoes come off and i only buy comfortable shoes now I've oh yeah me to too the point where i am a beyond the fashion thing like i yeah. want them to look nice but when i find a comfortable pair of shoes i'll buy like five of them the exact same color that are comfortable because god forbid they change or get they ever discontinue it. it yeah well you should look into duck feet that's what i wear Duck feet? Duck feet shoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Duck they're feet? like feet. Feet. D duck duck feet. feet. Yeah. I have a wide foot and they like, I'm going to write they, that down. They hold my foot in. I have on the, I have on the Mary Jane right now. Um, and it looks like, like oh, that's cute. Well, they're like really thick soles, Italian crepe rubber, like sustainable leather. It's a Danish company, but they have a USA base, but. Yeah, they're very comfy. Nice. I have their boots too. Nice. I've never heard of that before. I, yeah. I've been wearing a pair of Rothies for a while. They're like oh, nice. black belly flats made of all recycled materials. Oh, nice. So, and they're machine washable. <laughs> oh, very nice. <laughs> you take the little insert out, you know, like the little sole insert out and, and throw it in a cold washing machine and let it air dry. And it, comes out exactly the same. Oh my same. gosh. That's amazing. <laughs> the more you know. Right? And it's made out of recycled paper plastic bottles rather. Oh, plastic that's bottles. so cool. But uh yeah, anyway. Okay. That's for you. I'm ready. ready? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready, dude. Okay. So welcome, Lindsay. How are you today? Hi, Marcy. I'm just lovely. It's been snowing at my house all day long. Really? Yeah. Like, I don't know, five, you're, six inches today. You're Midwest, correct? Yes. Northeastern Minnesota. Northeastern Minnesota. Minnesota. Nice. Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> I've never 
never heard of that before. But oh, don't. <laughs> this is hysterical. Do you have a lot of snow? Oh yeah, we have over a foot on the ground already. <gasps> wow. Yeah, yeah. We we usually get between seven to fourteen feet. <laughs> Just, you know, depending on the year. <laughs> I bet you have the best snowblower on the block. Well, we have two snowblowers and my husband has a truck with a plow on the front. Yeah. Okay. Serious, serious snow business. Yeah. We have some serious snow moving to do. We live on, we live on six acres. So we have like quite a lot of snow. We have a big driveway that basically has like a parking lot at the top of it. So we have a lot of snow to move. We have to... We have to snow blow paths like to our woodshed, to our wow. sauna. Like we have a whole operation. We have a fleet of snow moving equipment. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah I, I got up for, for school this morning and it was still dark out and as it usually is in the winter and my windshield wipers were frozen to my Oh, that's the worst. And I couldn't find the scraper because I hadn't needed it yet this year and whatever. Well, if you were in Minnesota, you would have, you would know where your scraper was and you would have a back, you would have a backup scraper. <laughs> yes. I probably would have several backup <laughs> scrapers. Uh, yeah. And I would have a car with heated seats and I don't know. So yes, yeah, it would be a necessity. So, so let's begin with uh, the six quick questions and then okay. we'll, we'll get into everything. All right. Um, so what six words would you use to describe yourself? Oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, they can be any part of speech. They don't have to be adjectives, even though I'm saying describe. <laughs> Okay. Um, I don't even remember. You sent me these questions earlier to, so I would know, and I don't even remember what I put. Um, I would say I am very authentic. I am very funny. Um, I am very generous. Uh, that's three words. <laughs> can, can you, can I cheat and you can tell me what I wrote down? Can I ask the teacher for the answers? To oh, the I, I don't, I don't have it. In front <laughs> oh, of you me. don't have it in front of you. Oh, hilarious. Okay. Authentic, funny, generous, uh, tenacious, um, truth telling I would add for you. Yes. Very, very truth telling, very honest and hmm, a nature lover. Nice. Yeah. Good. What's your favorite way to spend a day? Oh, Home alone by myself, like no one in the house, husband's gone, kids are gone, maybe even preferably the dogs are gone and I could just do whatever I wanted and it would be a summer day, like probably early August and I would lay on a blanket in my yard and just soak up the sun and then probably go skinny dipping. That's very specific. It's very specific. I like that. <laughs> Specific's good. Yeah. Specific's good. You have your own pool? Obviously, skinny dipping. No, no, no. We don't have our own pool. I just I just go to the river or the lake near me. Oh, like, oh, 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 oh. Minnesota has a few lakes. I'm, maybe you've heard. It's yes. a land of 10,000 lakes. So yes, I just yes, yes, yes. I just go to a lake or a river. And I actually live um, like as the crow flies. I live about two miles from Lake Superior. Oh, so, um, well, that's another I, reason why you have so much snow. Yes. Yes. So I uh, like love to go plunge in Lake Superior. It's always cold. So I do cold plunges in Lake Superior, but wow. if I'm just like swimming for fun, like I wouldn't, it is fun, but it's like not something that you go and do for hours and you just float no, in the water. No, 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 no. But if I'm like swimming for fun, I just go to like, there's some secret swimming holes near my house that tourists don't know about. And we keep them on the down low and nice. I'll just go to one of those. And then I just get butt naked and get in the water and it's the best. That's cool. Literally. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. My, my daughter, she goes to college in Massachusetts and her college is right on the Atlantic Ocean. And they've, she has, I don't, much to the chagrin of her friends, I think, or the, the surprise of their, her friends, she's just like stripped down to her underwear and gone into the Atlantic Ocean in February. And they're oh, like, nice. what the hell is wrong with you? She's like, it's the most exhilarating thing. She yeah, it, it makes you feel really amazing and like tingly and this like high. I mean, it's it's pretty awesome. Yeah, just don't stay in too long. You don't wind up with hypothermia. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> However, if you're familiar with the work of Wim Hof, I don't know if you know who that guy is. No. Um. Okay, so he's like 
his nickname is the Iceman and he's so crazy. Like he climbed Mount Kilimanjaro in like shorts and, and bare feet. Wow. And he's like run a marathon in the Arctic in shorts. Like he's, he pushes his body to the edge of the extremes of cold temperatures. And so, um, from learning uh, from his work and from his books and other things, like I've learned how to, um, train my body to keep my temperature up even in really cold water. So it's like you, we really have more control over our bodies than we realize. I'm sure I've, I've heard a lot about cold plunges being really a wonderful antidote to anxiety and depression. Yeah. Cold plunges are one of my favorite, uh, ways to work with the autonomic nervous system. So, um, maybe we'll get into that in today's interview, but, yeah. um, yeah, if, if your listeners are interested, I actually have a free training on how to hack your nervous system with cold plunges. If you wanted to link that in the show notes, oh, I can absolutely. send it to you. We'll send it in the show notes. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. Um, okay. Let's get to question three. What is your okay. favorite childhood memory? Um, so <laughs> When I was a little girl, I grew up on a horse ranch in uh, the Texas Panhandle and my younger brother and I would, we had this brown duffel bag and in the brown duffel bag, we would pack like snacks and pocket knives and extra BBs for the BB gun. And we had this brown blanket that we like carted around with us everywhere. And we would take all of these things out to like the middle of our pasture, as far away from our house as we could get. And there was like a little creek down there and it kind of went into a valley. So you couldn't even see the house if you were down there, which meant nice. no one from the house could see you. Right. And we just played and played down there. I mean, like we, we played like we were settlers on the prairie. We were like cowboys nice. on the, in the wilderness and the wild west. Like we, we talk bad about our parents because we knew that they wouldn't hear us. So that's probably my favorite childhood memory. That's cool. Are you close with him? Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Still. <laughs> that's awesome. What's your favorite meal? Okay. So there's a restaurant about an hour away from me called Duluth Grill. And they have uh, an item on the menu called bibimbap, which is a Korean dish. Mm -hmm. And this restaurant in uh, Duluth Grill is very big on like sourcing ingredients as locally as possible. And oh, I love that. like they grow a lot of their own produce in their parking lot and they get eggs and maple syrup and beef and pork and all that from local um, farmers. And so the bibimbap is locally uh, pasture raised ground beef and pork mixed together and seasoned with locally harvested wild rice um, fermented kimchi, fermented chilies, a sunny side up pastured local egg, wow. um, sauteed mushrooms that were either foraged locally or grown on their premises, kale harvested from their parking lot. That's like sauteed in like ginger and uh, soy sauce. And then there's an half of an avocado on top. And then it, the whole thing is covered in like Korean barbecue sauce that they make homemade there. Wow. And every time we go to that restaurant, which is, I mean, we went a lot less during COVID, but before COVID I was going like at least once a month and every single time that's what I ordered to the point that I would go in there and we would have a server and they would be like, Oh, I know you, I know what you want, you know? <laughs> and, and I've said many times that like, if I ever knew that I was going to die, like the next day, that would be my last meal. Wow. Yeah. It's you that love good. It that much. It's that good. Well, you know it very well. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm putting a shameless plug in for Duluth grill. If any of your listeners are ever in Duluth, Minnesota, they should definitely eat there. Wow. It sounds very interesting. I, yeah. I would like to try it. It's so good. Excellent. Um, all right. Number five, what one piece of advice would you like to give your younger self? Always listen to your intuition. Mm. Don't let anybody else be more of an authority over what you should do than you. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Intuition <laughs> never lies. It's always leading you in the right direction. Yeah. Too many of us don't trust our yeah. intuition, our inner voices. We think that everyone else outside of us knows better. And yeah, they don't outsource your, don't outsource your, your inner knowing. Yeah. 
Yeah. Amen. That's fabulous. Um, number six, what is one thing you would most like to change about the world? I know, oh right? Gosh, there's so many things. Um, it's a little I, w- I wish that everybody in the world would read a book called Ubuntu. Yeah. Um, and it's about contributionism. And I wish people would understand that like this very like capitalistic nuclear families living in single homes, um, not, not raising children with a village, um, like not bartering and trading with each other, but everything is like, has monetary value, Mm -hmm. not knowing a lot of skills. I wish, I wish that could change because that's honestly the only thing that's going to get us through the apocalypse, which by the way, we're already in, in case people don't realize that we're already (laughs) in the apocalypse. Um, it's, it doesn't look anything like Hollywood said it would, it's not an asteroid that's about to hit the earth. Like, right. Um, those we have a handle on. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. We could totally just nuke those. Um, yeah, it, it would be contributionism. I would love to see contributionism and community and collaboration over competition and capitalism. Yeah, I agree with you. I, for, for a long time, I've been talking to my students, actually haven't in the last couple of years because I've gotten waylaid, but it's probably more important now than ever about the concept of Ubuntu, yeah. which I had read through um, Desmond Tutu years ago. Okay. And uh I, I think that I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. That, that I mean, that's how we that's how we were before before industrialization. Of, yeah, before industrialization and capitalism and colonialism and all that. Like that's that's how we were. And if people are interested in learning more, not about Ubuntu, but specifically these like other side concepts that I'm talking about, two really good books are *The Long Descent* by John Michael Greer and uh, *The Beautiful World Our Hearts Know Is Possible* by Charles Eisenstein. Okay. I'm writing them down. Yeah, they're great. Okay. Very cool. I'm always looking for new books. Um, and then one other question that's not really on the six quicks, but um, okay. I'm, I'm adding for season two is what TV shows might you be binging? Oh, that's easy. Um, <laughs> I'm so just I have. I have two just like top favorite TV shows. They never disappoint me. If I can't find anything else to watch, I just go back and watch them again. And they are The Office and Outlander. Oh, Outlander's awesome. Yes. So I guess if I'm not binging those, I love to binge The Great British Baking Show. Okay. Um, Yeah. I love, love I love, I haven't seen it. Oh, it's good. It's so good. I love period dramas. Me too. I love period drama. So that's why I love Outlander so much. My husband and I just recently finished watching um, a very well done show uh, on PBS called Victoria. It's like, it's three seasons. Oh, that's seasons fabulous. Of, it was so love well done. It. And I was Googling and fact checking the whole time. Uh-huh. And other than her sister, they stayed pretty close yeah. to historical accuracy, which I really, really appreciate. Um yeah, like Downton I wish they Abbey. were making more, but they. Oh, didn't. I know, I know, I yeah, but I guess Victoria's life after Prince Albert died was just not very fun anymore. Like I suppose he was a drag, you know. <laughs> <laughs> nice. She was way funner when Albert was still alive. Well, you know. Yeah. Anyway, that that's neither here nor there. <laughs> Yeah, I love those period dramas. And... Me too. I love a good period drama. Yeah, it's, it's fabulous. All right, so so let's get down to the the nitty gritty. I know you mostly through Instagram, and um, I love your Instagram. Oh, thank um, you. The things that you post every single time I look at your post, I'm like, yes absolutely that's the way it is you know i'm so excited and there's so much of what you say that just speaks to my own experience and my own thoughts and and so on about things and you say things in such a succinct way that oh, i you. think you're welcome that i think uh that, that that you that's why you have the following that you have because you speak to so many people um thank so you. i was hoping that maybe you could tell us all a little bit more about like where well where, where you said texas panhandle but like where little Lindsay was from and and who she was and how you got to do what it is that you do now okay so you basically want the cliff notes of my whole life story yeah okay 
Okay. All right. I can do that. Um, so I was raised in the Texas panhandle. Um, my biological parents were divorced before I was two years old. So I have no memory of my biological parents living together or being in their house together, but I also don't have any memories of them like fighting and divorcing. Sure. My mom raised me mostly as a single mom. I did visitation with my dad, um, like every other weekend, every other holiday kind of thing. When I was seven, my mom met and married uh, my stepfather and we moved from central Texas where I was born to the Texas panhandle. So I was seven when that happened, started at a new school. Um, I had this new dad. He had a son who was my new brother. Um, that was the brother that I would go out into the pasture with and we nice. would, you know, play. Bond, um, yeah. yeah. And we had a great relationship, my stepbrother and I, um, I, desperately wanted my stepfather to love me. Um, and we did grow to love each other, but it took a long time. Um, initially he was, um, pretty, he was pretty volatile. Um, he was, he was a recovering alcoholic who wasn't in any kind of program. So he ended up leaving AA and when we moved his answer to AA was for us to start going to the first Southern Baptist church. And so that's when evangelical fundamentalist Christianity made its way into my life. And, um, at home, our family was, um, not very well off financially. I wouldn't say we were in poverty, but like, I definitely remember my mom putting groceries on a credit card. Um, Mm -hmm. or like, I definitely remember I used to play office with my mom and she would get all the bills out and I would get the envelopes and the stamps and the checkbook and all the thing. And like, I would play pretend office. Right. And she would let me write the checks and address the envelopes and put the stamps on and put the stub in the envelope. Like I did all those things. And I remember a lot of times doing that with my mom on like a Saturday morning and there being many instances where she would be like, Oh, we don't have enough to pay that whole bill. Just pay this much of it. So really early on in life, I got this message that like, we don't have enough. Mm -hmm. Um, and so going to church, I, I found a lot of solace in church because my home environment was so volatile. So my stepfather being a recovering alcoholic who wasn't in a program, um, was physically, emotionally, and verbally abusive. Um, he really loved, um, like the sound of his belt whenever it would go (gasps) through the belt loops and he would just like, pull it off and just like go to town on us. Uh-oh, um, God. yeah, there mother was, several... was okay with that or she was being brutalized too. No, she wasn't being physically abused, but I think, I think my mom was just really disempowered and, um, they, she, she was a stay at home mom and they had a baby very shortly after they got married. So she was like home with the baby and my stepbrother and me, um, And I think she just didn't feel like she had a way out. And I know that my mom and my stepdad fought about me specifically a lot because my mom did want to defend me. Um, I just think she was really disempowered, which Mm -hmm. I know like that was her own choice, right? Like she, she had a choice. Um, so church became like a solace for me. And that was like a place that I could go to get away from my family. And, um, it wasn't as volatile as my home life was. So it became like a haven and, I really latched onto the message of the church that if I accepted Jesus into my heart and prayed the center of prayer and read my Bible and did devotionals and went to church and like was a good Christian girl that like that would make God really, really happy. And, um, so combine that with like my stepfather being the way that he was and me always like being afraid of him and wanting to do whatever I could to keep myself safe. Um, that morphed me into like a pretty hardcore people pleaser. Mm. Um, so also growing up in the church, even though it was a solace for me and like, I didn't realize how toxic it was until about eight years ago when I started deconstructing my faith, um, because it was in the South in the nineties and early two thousands. Um, that's when a movement called the purity, purity movement or purity culture was like sweeping through, America really, but it was really prominent in the Bible belt. So this okay. was this like movement, um, where the emphasis was like true love weights. So it was like abstinence only sex education. Ah. Um, and there was a lot of emphasis placed on like girls, especially remaining virgins until they're married and like keeping their bodies and their minds pure for their future husband. And, 
um, like I remember going to church camps where like the boys were allowed to go swimming in the church camp pool in a swimsuit with no shirt, but the girls weren't allowed to wear bikinis. You know, it was like all of these mixed messages around sure. modesty. And like, I was taught that if a boy looked at me and had lust in his heart, that I was causing him to sin. <laughs> um, just a lot wow. of pressure. Yeah. That's a lot horrible. of, oh, it's yeah. But it's so common in the South. Like it's so common. So, um, not your yeah, responsibility just, to control someone else's thoughts. Well, correct. It's not, but that's not what the evangelical church was telling us circa 1997, wow. you know? So, um, that, that was very confusing for me because I was a very normal, healthy, developing teenager with curiosity and hormones and like curious about my sexuality. And I never had a problem having a boyfriend. And so there, I got into this cycle in high school of like, dating a lot and messing around with my boyfriends. And then after we would mess around, I would be like, oh my gosh, we have to pray and ask God to forgive us. And we can never, ever do this again. Granted, we weren't having sex. We were like making out and like dry humping, you know, (laughs) like what normal teenagers do Of course, because, because there was this Jesus and church and sin element to it. It it made all of that, like completely full of shame. Uh Um, so that was the water I was swimming in as a kid. It was like very unsafe at home and I found safety in church and didn't realize until 30 years later, how unsafe it actually was and how traumatizing it actually was. So, um, I got married when I was 19. Um, we met right after high school and I got married at 19. We had our first baby before I was 21, we had our second baby before, or right after I turned 22. Um, we, we met at church. Um, so I was an intern for the youth group that I had just graduated from. And he, my husband now is, was a youth pastor. And so we met, started dating. It was love at first sight, like totally fell in love. Um, got married 16 months after we married or met and, we were always involved in ministry together, either part-time or full-time ministry. My husband is a really, really talented acoustic guitar player. So he was a worship leader. Um, and I would sing with him and we were kind of this like powerhouse worship leading duo in the Texas panhandle at that time. And we would get invited to different churches and church camps to go lead worship for an event or to fill in when their worship leader was out of town or something like that. Um, so our whole lives revolved around, ministry and church. And, um, because I was raised the way that I was raised, I was taught that my only purpose as a girl woman was to grow up, get married, have babies, be a keeper of the home, be a Proverbs 31 woman, honor my husband, submit What's to my Proverbs husband. 31? What does that mean? Oh, okay. <laughs> so Proverbs 31 is a chapter from the Bible, um, that it's basically like 26 verses that, So the first nine verses are not really about women. It's like verse 10 and on, um, is about basically like what a godly woman is supposed to do. So like, it's all about like busyness and keeping her husband happy and, um, very old world patriarchal idea. Oh, very. Yes, 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 yes. So yeah. So that's the like water I was in at that time. Um, and I, I mean, I didn't know there's anything wrong with it. So I like, I was happy, you know, well, like I'm happy and it provides meaning in your life. And then it, this probably is nothing. wrong. Well, with it, it. it did at the time, but like, I also didn't realize that I was like, had an anxiety disorder, you know, like, oh, well, there's that. I yes. mean, I couldn't, I couldn't <laughs> sit still. I didn't know how to just hold my babies. Like I always had to be cleaning or cooking, like mm-hmm. it just like tons of perfectionism and, and measuring my worth by my productivity and yeah. like all of that. Um, and just to the point that I just completely exhausted myself. Um, See, so, I had that and I didn't grow up in the church. I'm a nice Jewish girl from Long Island and I oh, still had that. there you go. So okay. It's just everywhere. <laughs> it is. It's just everywhere. Um, so yeah, then let's see, we, we were in ministry for, for 12 years together. Um, by the time my husband was in like a full-time, like senior staff position at a church, Um, I was, we were 30 and, um, we thought like, this is where we're going to be forever. Like we had the cutest house on this adorable street and our church was growing like crazy because we were the new worship leaders and everybody wanted to come hear us. And like, it was, it was great. You would have like, you would have never wanted to leave that except 
I was, you know, doing my stay at home mom thing. I was homeschooling our children because we had to keep them out of the secular world and protect them from the devil, you know? So we were Christian homeschoolers. And one day I was folding laundry and I decided to watch some Netflix while I was folding laundry. And I happened to turn on, I don't even know how I found it, but I happened to turn on this documentary called for the Bible tells me. So I think is the name of it. And it was about either Lutheran or Episcopalian. I can never remember. Um, ministers who were gay. And I thought it was just going to confirm what I already believed, which was that being gay was a sin and it was an abomination. Like I was raised to be very homophobic um, and racist. So like, I thought this show was going to confirm my homophobic beliefs. And instead it completely unraveled my homophobic beliefs. And like, it's, it's a shift that was the fastest shift I've ever experienced in my life. Like I turned that documentary on as a homophobic person. And two hours later, I turned that documentary off and I was no longer homophobic. And I was just like, that was just bullshit. Like, yeah. And my husband got home from the church that day and we put the kids to bed that night. And I was like, you have to watch this movie. And he was, I showed him what it was. And he was like, "Ugh, I don't need to watch that. Like, I already know what I believe about that. And I was like, no, babe, really, you need to watch this movie. So for the second time that day, I watched it with him and it was his first time. And at the end of it, his jaw was like on the floor and he had that immediate shift as well. So here we were 30 years old and we were raised. You don't question the Bible. You don't question God. God's ways are higher than our ways. Who could even pretend to understand like God's mind or or the rules or, or his commandments or whatever. And here we were 30 years old. And it was the first time in our lives that either one of us had the guts to be like, if what we were taught about gay people is wrong, what else have we been taught that's wrong? Right. And so we, that, that began our deconstruction. We didn't have the word deconstruction in our vocabulary at the time, but that's what it was. Right. And we what, spent- what else can we find the truth about? Yeah, exactly. So we spent the next several months just going down the rabbit hole of documentaries and YouTube videos and reading different books. Um, One book that was really, really influential on us was called uh, Pagan Christianity um, by Frank Viola. Um, And that one was like, once we finished reading that book, David and I were both like, okay, we can't continue to receive a paycheck from the church and stay in our integrity because like, Mm -hmm. we don't actually believe a lot of it anymore (laughs) but we show up every Sunday and we have our face on like we do right because that's what you do so I'm really proud of the way we left that church actually we did it without scandal we did it without causing any kind of scene nobody knew what we were doing at home in private Um, thankfully David is also a very talented technology person Mm -hmm. so he was able to find a job um, as a network administrator for a school and we moved eight hours away which ended up being one of the best decisions we've ever made because uh, both of our families who are also evangelical Christians and his side of the family, actually, you may not believe this, every male member of my husband's family, his dad, his brothers, his uncles, and all of his male cousins yeah. are all evangelical pastors. <clears throat> Talk about a family business. Yeah. So we are literally the black sheep. So when we moved, we moved eight hours away from all of that. And well, it would be hard to be an island in the middle of all of that. Oh my gosh, it would have been impossible. And and like we didn't know it at the time, but it was just again listening to our intuition, right? right. Of just like this is the next step that we need to take, and we don't know what's going to happen next, but we just know this is the next thing. So we moved to um, a town in Texas, about eight hours away. It was in East Texas. It's called Tyler. Um, we lived there for about a year. We didn't go to church. Well, we've never been to church since, um, since 2014, um, bit 13. Yeah. 2013 was the last time we were in church. So yeah, we, we moved to East Texas. We made some really amazing non-churchy friends. Um, they're still some of our best friends to this day. Excellent. We, yeah, we, it was like a, it was like a full body sigh of relief to live there because we didn't know anybody. People weren't judging us. We We weren't in start over. Yeah. Yeah, We could totally start over. And it was like the first time ever that we had had ever been able to determine what our identity as a family was outside of that Christian pastor lifestyle. How did the kids take to this change? Um, the kids were really surprisingly very open to it. Um, 
they were like eight and nine at the time. And so I don't think they were really even old enough for it to be like a core part of their identity, you know? Sure. Um, so it was mostly just flexible. Totally. Yeah. So it was like, they asked like, why aren't we going to church anymore? And we were just like, because we don't want to go to church anymore. And I remember our son being like, good. I didn't like it anyway. They repeat <laughs> they, the songs repeat too much. <laughs> um, okay. So That's yeah. Valid. So during all this time, something I haven't shared is like for the whole time, my husband and I have been married at this point, at this point, it was 12 years. Um, I had wanted to move back out to the country. I grew up on a horse ranch and like living rural is in my roots. Um, my dad's side of the family have all been landowners for as far back as we know, um, and have been farmers and ranchers. And it's just like in my blood to live rural. Mm -hmm. And the whole time we've been married, we'd sort of been looking for rural property and hadn't found what we wanted. And so of course, when we moved to Tyler, we continued our search for something rural and, um, just weren't finding it. Like I, I just wanted a three bedroom, two bathroom house on at least five acres. And everything we looked at was either like the so house huge, was falling apart. Small, right. Yeah. Or it was really expensive or like the house next door had a bunch of old cars parked in the front yard or, you know, like it was just not what we were looking for. And so finally one day I just told my husband, you know what? I'll live anywhere. I don't have to live in Texas. I'll live anywhere. And he was like, so you're saying I can look anywhere. And I was like, no, you, you can't look in California, Oregon or, uh, California, Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona, like nowhere in the Southwest, nowhere in the Southeast, Vermont would be fine. I would be fine with Vermont. I would be fine with Washington state. Um, like the Midwest didn't even come up. Like, right. <laughs> I think people forget that the Midwest even exists, didn't even come up. But one day he was like, okay, I found this company. They're looking for a director of technology. I just sent them my resume they're in Minnesota. And I was like, fuck that. I'm not going <laughs> to live in Minnesota. Like it's too cold. They're going to see that you're from Texas. They're not going to want to move somebody from Texas. They're going to want somebody more local. <sighs> Two weeks later, we were on an airplane. They were flying us up to talk to him, to let him tour the facility. It was an organic food company. So they wanted to let him tour the facility. They hooked us up with a realtor. Um, before we got on the plane to go there, of course, I was like on realtor.com going, okay, this is a possibility. I got to find us a place to live. And I found a, a three bedroom, two bath house on almost six acres. And there were no photos of the outside though. It was only photos of the inside. And it was this like 1970, like rectangle that was a time capsule and had not been updated since 1970. Yikes. And it was like the only one that was my three bedroom, two bathroom, five acres, and that we could afford. Right. And so, um, we hooked up with the realtor and she took us to look at two other properties that day. And then the last property was this one and this one, I'm saying this one, cause we ended up buying it. <laughs> I figured. But, yeah. And so like the second we pulled up the driveway, I just felt like deep within me. This is it. Like this, this is it. Oh, this you know, when you know. This yeah. is what you've been waiting for. So it doesn't look like a 1970s rectangle anymore. We've done so much to it. Um, we moved up here in 2015. So we've been here for six and a half years now. We are officially deconstructed and deconverted from Christianity. Um, our, we don't see our families nearly as much anymore, which whatever you well, want to make of that is fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, we've just, we've really like carved out an, an identity for ourselves, like That's as awesome. individuals, as a family, as a couple. Um, but of course, like no big change like that happens without some difficulty as well. So sure. we started to have some difficulty in 2018. Um, basically everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Like everything from things in our house, breaking, leaking, our cars breaking, um, we had a chimney fire in our house in February of 2018. And then on black Friday, 2018, we had a fire in our Finnish sauna that like did like 20 grand worth of damage to our sauna. So we bookended wow. 2018 with two fires and then like everything in between was basically a dumpster fire. So our marriage was on thin ice, like I was having incredible anxiety. My husband was going through some kind of like attachment disorder or uh, not attachment adjustment disorder. Um, like it was just 
bonkers, Marcy. It was so bonkers. Wow. And well, if you can get I, through that, you can get through anything. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. So by the fall of 2018 though, like my husband was doing better. We'd fix the house. We'd fix the cars. Like our finances were in better shape. Like everything was, was feeling better. And it was like, my body finally had a time to just be like, Oh, like sigh of relief. Right. Right. And we had about six weeks in the fall of 2018 that were very nice, very peaceful. And then in late October of 2018, that's when, I mean, the only way I know how to describe it is like, I was trying to hold everything together for the whole year and I didn't have to hold everything together anymore. And my body was like, okay, now, now you're going to pay for that. Like, ah. and I don't mean that in like, my body was punishing me. I don't believe our bodies punish us. I just no. believe like it had had enough. Of it had had enough. Yeah, exactly. So I started having a lot of pelvic issues, it started as a urinary tract infection. And then when the infection was gone, my urethra was still spasming for like five months. Yikes. Um, yeah, I was, I was diagnosed with pelvic congestion syndrome in January of 2019, which is varicose veins in the pelvis. Wow. Um, I didn't even know that yeah. was possible. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, so, and then the spasming urethra, I ended up, that was a diagnosis of pelvic floor dysfunction. So I started pelvic floor physical therapy. Um, but I wasn't sleeping. I hadn't slept in months. I was having constant panic attacks, like pacing the floor, wringing my hands, um, basically unable to function. Like I lost, I lost my ability to get out of bed. I couldn't cook. I couldn't run my kids around places. I wasn't at the time I was a food blogger and I had a really successful food blog. And like, I wasn't able to do anything on my website and thank God I had ads on my website and I was generating passive income from that because otherwise we would have been so screwed. Um, it was, it was just a whole mess. And, um, on March 7th, 2019, I attempted suicide. <gasps> Um, Lindsay. Yeah. Yeah. I can talk about it. It's totally not a trigger at all. (laughs) Well, thank Um, goodness. Yeah. No, I I have no shame about it whatsoever. And like, or should you? No, fuck. No, I shouldn't. Um, I have really, really strong opinions about suicide prevention though. I think suicide prevention is bullshit. Like I I do. I think efforts at preventing people from killing themselves are, are complete bullshit because I had all the support in the world, you know, like I had people, I had security in my life. I was like, I wasn't homeless. I wasn't my, we weren't jobless. Like we weren't broke. Um, right. We weren't unhealthy. Like, but yeah, I just what led I, you to think you had no other alternative. Um, because the insomnia and the anxiety went on for so long that I was basically, um, so if you're familiar with like polyvagal theory and nervous system states, like at mm-hmm. the, at the very bottom of the polyvagal ladder is like shut down, right? That's like, um, you can't move. Um, some people like faint, like that's the, that's the state that, uh, some animals go into, like they can make themselves play dead. Like right. that's a shutdown state. Okay. Um, but there's a combined state where you're in that like shutdown and you have, really anxious, uh, buzzy fight flight energy at the same time. So it's like, it's almost like if you thought about like, um, you know, on the Flintstones when Fred and Barney are like in the car and they're like pedaling Uh with their feet, but when they're like pedaling really fast, but the car's not moving, Uh you know, like that's what it felt like. So it was, it was, it was like, I couldn't get out of it. I just couldn't get out of it. And I could not see any way out. I could not see that my life would be better. Um, I mean, when I say insomnia, I I'm talking like five months of no more than two hours of sleep, of sleep at night, like yeah, every that night just does something terribly drastic to your brain. Oh my God. I, I know now why they use sleep deprivation as a form of torture, like really. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just couldn't see a way out of that. And, um, I, I, I was bedridden at the time because, laying down was the only thing that made my pelvic floor feel better. Um, pelvic congestion syndrome is a condition that is very, very affected by gravity. So when you're upright, all the blood pools in your veins, um, which causes like abdominal distension, bloating pressure in your pelvic floor. Um, like it feels like something's going to fall out of your pelvic floor. Um, yeah, it's just terrible. Like a lot of pain cramping. It's just terrible, but lying down helps because then the gravity isn't. So I was just in bed like all the time. 
And in early March, we called my mother-in-law, um, who is one of my favorite people on the, on the planet, even though she's an evangelical pastor's wife. Um, she's so generous and giving and so helpful. And we called her up, like basically like, Hey, Lindsay's dysfunctional and we need some help. And she showed up and like, she became my hands. Like she was cooking, cleaning, doing our laundry, running wow. the kids wherever they needed to go, like going grocery oh, shopping grandma. for us. Oh yeah. She was freaking amazing. And, um, I wasn't consciously thinking this at the time, but now that I look back, I'm like, that's why I did it. Then I attempted suicide while she was here. And I, I realized oh. later it was because I knew my family wouldn't be on their own. She'd be there. Right. Like I didn't have that conscious thought, but I realized it later. So, um, yeah, after I attempted suicide on March 7th, um, obviously I failed and I checked Thank myself goodness. in. Yeah. I checked myself into inpatient mental health. Um, stayed there for five days, got on a really strong, but needed cocktail of psych meds, um, and checked myself out after five days. And I've been building my life back ever since. And wow. so I'm no Top longer a food story. blogger. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm no longer a food blogger. As you can see, I'm a trauma educator and a coach and my, my current line of work comes directly out of that experience of, okay just realizing that like when I got out of the hospital and I was on those meds um, and I don't have a problem with meds now, I used to have a lot of stigma against psych meds. Um, and I said that I would never take them and all that kind of stuff. And the universe is like, haha, hold my beer. Um, but, <laughs> you know, so I, I very quickly learned some very humbling lessons and um, but I was like, you know what? I'm not ashamed to have these psych meds. I'm really thankful for them because they were helping me sleep. They, they were helping me not have panic attacks. Like they yeah. were a lifesaver, but deep down in my core, again, listening to my intuition, like I knew that psych meds were not a forever thing for me. I knew that they were going to be a temporary thing. And I was, I made a commitment to myself that, um, I was going to do whatever it took to excavate whatever caused me to need the psych meds in the first place. So like, okay. I'm going to like get, I, I, so that's when I did, I started excavating trauma and like, just learning how to feel my feelings, learning how to be in my body and not check out of my body and not overthink everything, learning how to discharge the stored energy of trauma, learning how to move my body. Pelvic floor physical therapy was extremely helpful with that because when you're doing like very minute pelvic floor exercises. It takes a lot of focus and it forces you deep into your body. Yeah. Um, so I'm so grateful literally for that. Literally the core. Of yeah, everything. literally. Yeah, literally. Yeah. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, I, I started learning cold plunges and, um, that's when I started learning about the autonomic nervous system and implementing cold plunges and then learning how to hack my nervous system. Um, I, I just learned so many things so rapidly and, I am so grateful that I already worked from home. I already had this food blog with passive income set up. So I basically got to take like a year and a half and just focus on myself. That's and amazing. it was the greatest gift I ever could have had. And honestly, I don't know how people with full-time jobs outside the home and little kids and like, I, I don't know how people like that carve out time for themselves to heal. I really don't. It's hard. Um, and I'm so grateful that I had the ability to do what I was doing. And yeah, in the summer of 2020, um, the, the phrase holistic trauma healing dropped into my awareness. Mm -hmm. Um, I knew that that was going to be the next thing that I did. I didn't know what it was going to look like or, or what it was going to be. Um, then I, I did an acid trip on July 31st, 2020. And that's when it all like came. It Did you do it on came. your own or were you guided by a professional? Uh, no, no, no. I've never done psychedelics with a professional. Um, unfortunately <laughs> I would love to, but no, I was just with my husband. It was just he and I. Um, so yeah, the, the magic of LSD and of that psychedelic experience, like cracked me open and what I wasn't receiving in my normal state of consciousness, I like received very quickly as a download from the universe in that yeah. state. I've been hearing a lot about stuff. About yeah, that, it's really you know, it's... psychedelics and MDMA and 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 the the very quick, intensely therapeutic results that come from even one experience. Yeah, yeah, I've had several experiences now, and and they've all they've all been profound. Um, some of them pre like 
in 2018 and before those experiences were like very anxiety inducing. Mm -hmm. But since I've done all of this healing work on myself, like now, whenever I have a psychedelic experience, it's always just incredibly beautiful and gentle um, and, and very healing. So, so yeah, I, I started the podcast in October of 2020 and I opened my first round of coaching clients in September of this year. And it's only um, been a few months. Tough. That's wonderful. I know it. And it's crazy. Like I get referrals from therapists. I get therapists who want me to coach them. I have amazing guests on my podcast. Um, my podcast is an amazing free resource and yeah, I, I just, this is what I was born to do. Like, this has been my purpose all along and I'm, it's so fulfilling and I love it so much. So that was the cliff notes. I know that was like 30 minutes, but those are the cliff notes of my life story. Wow. <laughs> oh, it's very intense. Thank you for sharing all of that. It's a yeah. very vulnerable thing to do. I appreciate that. For sure. Very cool. How you got from one thing to another. So, so now you have, um, all this expertise you've mentioned several times about hacking your autonomic uh, autom let me say that again hacking your autonomic nervous system say that five times fast yeah um how, how did you find this and what do you do and how yeah does it help? And <laughs> that's a great question um so i i initially learned about the autonomic nervous system um where did i initially learn about it so i learned about neuroplasticity yes. first from a woman named Annie Hopper, who has a program called the Dynamic Neural Retraining System, or DNRS. Okay. And the retraining system is, is focusing on the brain and the limbic system specifically. Right. So after I, I bought her course, I watched all the videos and I started practicing the DNRS. The science of everything she shared like made so much sense to me. It felt like a yes in my body. But then as I was practicing her program, it felt very forced. And okay. I was like, this is not sustainable. Like it was taking over an hour a day sometimes. Like it was a lot of work. Um, there's part of her program where you're supposed to, uh, like there's these like steps on the floor and you like do these steps every day on the floor. And one of the steps was to um, bring up like happy memories from childhood and, and to describe them in detail, to put yourself in that elevated emotional state. Okay. And, um, then the next step of the process is to, um, create or envision something that you want to do in the future. That's also very happy. So then you're still in that elevated emotional state. Well, I found it very difficult to access positive memories from my past and so I was like recycling the same memories over and over. And so. after a few days of that, it was just like, they're not even exciting anymore. You know, right. like, like how many times can I, can I describe making pies with my Mima and feel an elevated emotional state before it just gets stale? Like you said. Sure. So I dropped that, but I took the knowledge of the limbic system and neuroplasticity with me. And then that's when I started learning about the autonomic nervous system. And I started studying like Joe Dispenza. Um, mm -hmm. Then I found a protocol called the Nemechek protocol. And it's written by a doctor named Dr. Patrick Nemechek. I read that book and that's where I learned the majority of what I know about the autonomic nervous system. Um, and it was just like, okay, this makes so much sense. Wim Hof also talks a lot about the autonomic nervous system. So I just was pulling from different places and like piecing something together. And I was only doing it for myself. Like I right. never had the idea that one day I'm going to coach people and do this. Like never, this was all just for myself, but of course I'm a very open, transparent person. And so I was talking about what I was doing on my food blog, Instagram account at the time. And I just was getting all of this positive response and feedback. And I came to realize that so many of the like chronic and mysterious health symptoms that I had had for most of my twenties and thirties that couldn't be explained in lab work, couldn't be explained sure. by a doctor, couldn't really be diagnosed as this or that, but they're always there. Um, I, I was like, it's, it's the autonomic nervous system. Like that's the thing that connects mm -hmm. everything together. And all of these chronic and mysterious symptoms that aren't diagnosable as any one specific thing 
are the red flags that my body is giving me to let me know that my nervous system is not in a good regulated, safe state. Sure. So that's when the like nervous system hacking began. And, um, I use a, like, I'm very, very much a believer in the bottom up approaches. So that's like the somatic experiencing, Mm -hmm. shaking, um, dancing, embodiment, um, body work, um, like all the, the breath work, all the bottom up stuff. But what I found was that trauma also causes a lot of inflammation in your brain. And so you can do all the breath work and cold plunges and, and, you know, body work and and all that, that you want. And that's great, but you're going to hit a ceiling because you're not addressing the brain inflammation piece. And that's where the Nemechek protocol came in because it's a a brain inflammation uh, protocol. It's very, very simple. Um, you should definitely link the book in the show notes. Oh, I will. Okay. Um, but Yeah. So that, then I was like, oh, here's this top down approach. Like I'm already doing the body stuff. Now I can do the brain stuff and coming from the food blogging world that I was in, I was in the health and wellness niche of food blogging. So I had done all kinds of restrictive diets and gluten-free and dairy-free and paleo and keto and restricting sugar and restricting carbs and like buying everything organic and local and non-GMO and pasture raised. And like, I was into Weston A. Price stuff for a long time. I was fermenting and soaking everything and sprouting things and like all of that. And I I had been in this toxic diet culture sure. for so long. And that so culture- many of us get stuck in there. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, and that's like actually one of the reasons that I think um, people come to me for coaching is because they've seen me get out of that. Mm-hmm. And like- they, they see that it's possible and they want that too. And so, um, a lot of my work is like helping people deconstruct from that health and wellness culture, like toxic health and wellness culture. Um, but that culture places a lot of emphasis on the gut. And it's always talking about like, if you heal your gut, you heal your body and the gut brain connection and all of that. And it's not wrong, but it, they're all the focus is on the gut. Nobody's talking about the brain. You know, yeah. they're like, just take more probiotics and drink more bone broth and for eliminate. Me the, the, for me, the problem is my adrenal gland, mm. not my gut. My gut's fine. I've been yeah. addressing that for decades. That's fine. But well, your after- autonomic nervous system controls your, uh, your hormone production. Right. And after my hysterectomy, I no longer own ovaries. Mm. My, my thyroid and my adrenal gland were like, you want us to do what now? You know, yeah. so- yeah the metabolism got shot and they went in the crapper and, you know, I'm now addressing it with supplements from a nutritionist. That's um, I think helping, but uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's a long, it's, I mean, I was on that, I was on the hamster wheel of wellness for over a decade. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And it just wasn't working. So I started openly speaking out against like the gut as the Holy grail of health. And I was like, we need, we need to be paying attention to the brain. Like, mm-hmm like, like trauma causes brain inflammation and like brain inflammation primes microglia and the brain and microglia when they're not primed are these amazing anti-inflammatory soothing lubricating white blood cells. But when microglia are primed, it's like Mr. Hyde and they become very pro-inflammatory and like they increase inflammatory cytokines and you know, that trickles down and it causes dysfunction in the autonomic nervous system because the autonomic nervous system is the highway from the body to the brain and back. Right. So, um, yeah, so my approach is, um, and consciousness and awareness and spirituality has been a big part of this journey too. Like part of, um, of, of my story is that after I was deconstructed and deconverted from Christianity, I thought about maybe identifying as an atheist for a minute and that just never felt right for me. And being able to reclaim and reconstruct a spirituality that's like just mine and that isn't sure. following rules of patriarchy or fun of, of yeah or to create whatever your own cosmology is exactly yeah so so i operate in the realm of like i have a soul that's lived many lifetimes and like that soul is my highest self mm-hmm. um, my intuition is my body's connection to the spirit realm like and to my highest self and like I believe my soul is here to learn lessons and to, um, elevate and level up and that, 
you know, I, I don't think the universe is punitive. I don't think God is punitive. Mm -hmm. um, I don't either. I think the universe is wise and loving and it wants us to be well. And it, it's even going to allow us to go through some really difficult things in order for us to be well. And <clears throat> I believe in love and compassion and empathy. And I want everything I do to be in service of love. And um, yeah, it's so, so awareness and consciousness is a foundation of my work as is the nervous system. And then I want to help people reduce brain inflammation. And then I also, um, this is a term that I coined, but I also help my clients reduce lifestyle inflammation. Lifestyle so, inflammation? Inflammation. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So that's like, that's like all the things in your lifestyle that aren't supporting what you want for yourself. Right. You know, like the job you the hate, toxicity stuff yeah, and, the job yeah. you hate, the boundaries you won't set, the relationship that's not fulfilling, working to pay for things you don't have the time to enjoy, mm -hmm. um, keeping up with the Joneses, like being in the rat race, like hustling, like that kind of shit. Um, so I'm really into like helping my clients identify that kind of stuff and, and shift it because you're not going to heal in the same lifestyle that you got sick in. No. You know, a lot of people think, oh, I'll just, I'll just figure out how to hack my brain and my body, but nothing about my life has to change. And I'm like, no, that's bullshit. It's that, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. There's a lot of behavioral shifts that have to happen, you know, eliminating toxic people and toxic situations and chronic toxic experiences, like you said, like jobs that you hate or, you know, the, the people who just get in your way all the time. Um, yeah. But some of it is is teaching ourselves how to not get in our own way you know i i know we have to get rid of the we have to get rid of the people pleasing thing you have to get rid yeah. of the being afraid to stand up for your own boundaries thing yeah you know? um yeah and learn how to say no to stuff amen to that you know i i i'm constantly fighting i'm pretty good with the saying no thing i'm pretty good with not <sighs> not allowing too many other people's agenda into my daily or weekly life, but I still have not yet learned that there are really only 24 hours in a day. <laughs> <laughs> and I, yeah. I fancy myself superwoman, you know, and, and mm. not like I can, you know, not that my house is perfect and all the dishes are done because there's still three days of dishes in my kitchen sink, but I still am going to bed too late because um reading or I'm being creative or I'm learning something new or I'm taking on another like podcast related education related project or something but it's all stuff I keep on my own plate you know ah. so so you're overheaping your own plate I'm overheaping my own plate well can I tell you the question that I ask all my clients yeah what purpose is that serving for you <laughs> um um I think it's slowly incrementally getting me the answers that I want for my own curiosity. I think it's sort of slowly getting me the knowledge that I want, but it's also very quickly unraveling my mental capacity and my patience and my ability to focus for more period for a longer period of time. So I, I do know that I need to schedule less. I need to anticipate doing or expect to do less each day and which will allow me to really, if you look at it from the inside, do more. Um, so yeah, I know. I, I know what to do and I know why. I just don't always implement. Uh-huh. You know? <laughs> yep. So, you know. Okay, I'll take my coach hat off and I will put my podcast guest hat back on. No, 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 it's totally fine. It's totally fine, you know. It, and it, it you know, it it rolls into a crappy morning on on the next day. So, so last night I was writing and working and thinking too late and I was staying up well past what I knew my bedtime should be and then pushed snooze for 45 minutes this morning, woke up the first word out of my mouth was a big old fuck and <laughs> um, you know, and then had a frozen windshield on my car and I was like six minutes late for school, which, you know, if it was a regular desk job, six minutes, what six minutes doesn't really matter. But I had a class of 26 12th graders waiting for me. So yeah. I had to call into school, you know, can someone babysit my class? You know, whatever. They don't mind. It doesn't happen often. But 
it was all because I went to bed too late the night before. Mm -hmm. All of it. Yeah. So, you know, this work is not all love and light. This work is, it takes a lot of self-discipline and it takes like, like my, my main objective, however we get there, my main objective is always, always to point people back to themselves, Mm -hmm. back to a place of self-responsibility, back to a place of realizing that they, whether you realize it or not, you, you always are choosing, you're always making choices. Yes. Most of our choices are unconscious, but when you start to shift that and you make more conscious choices, like then you can start creating the reality that you really want. And you're no longer a victim of the reality that you have. That was the unconscious reality. So it's not love and light and like toxic positivity for sure. Like there's a lot of, you know, wailing and gnashing of teeth involved, but um, yeah, I, I learned that years ago I was, um, I'd been in therapy for on and off for most of my adult life. And, um, I got to say about 2000, no, yeah, about 2012 ish, maybe I was, I was faced with a situation, a financial, emotional relationship situation that I didn't think there was an answer to. I, I said, I'm stuck, you know, I'm going to have to put up with this situation in perpetuity because I can't afford financially to make another decision. And my therapist said, well, you do have a choice. I'm like, what do you mean I have a choice? I don't have a choice. She's like, you might not like the choice. Yeah. You might not like the options, but you have a choice. Yeah. And uh, true. it took me a, probably a good hot minute to sit there and think about it. And I, I was like, well, I could do nothing. And stay where I am and have everything be shitty and have me feel like crap all the time. And that's a choice too. And that's a choice to stay and do nothing. (laughs) Or I can get out of my current living situation and, you know, deal with the financial fallout, but at least emotionally be safe and, and, and extricate myself and my children from this toxic bullshit. Yeah. And so that's what I did. And I found myself a a lawyer to handle the bankruptcy and just fucking dealt with it. That's amazing. And, and it sucked and it was blissful and heavenly at the same time. Yeah. I totally know that feeling, you know, Yeah. but, but I just, I needed somebody to sort of shake me up and say that. Yeah. And, and that most people do like most people, they, they they come to a place where they realize like the life I have is not the life I want. And if I don't do anything to change it, it's going to continue to be the life I don't want. And I'm going right. to look up, I'm going to look up when I'm 50, 60, 70 years old and I'm going to have regrets and I will have not pursued my dreams and I will have not followed my heart and I will have listened to other people over my own voice. And like, yeah. And that like, that's a recipe for dis-ease. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and the only, I talk about this all the time on the podcast, the only person who has the capacity, the agency, the ability, the power to do anything about anything in our lives is us. And that you don't need anybody else's damn permission to make the decision in your life or to make a choice in your life or to change your behavior or, you know, change your address or change your job or change your relationship or yeah, change but people anything. don't, but people don't because they feel stuck. Fear. Right. Well, well, the nervous system feels safe and whatever is familiar, like our nervous systems love familiar and that's where they feel safe. Even if safe or even if familiar is unhealthy, dysfunctional, chaotic, right? If that's what we're used to, then our nervous system is like, I'm, I'm safe here. But you right. logically know this isn't right. Right. But you can't logic your way out of dysfunction and chaos and lack of health. Like no. you have to do it in your body as well, because your body is what is feeling safe in that familiar but dysfunctional environment or in that safe, but or in that, yeah, familiar but dysfunctional relationship or job right. or whatever. So, so the work is, um, not to just like quit the job, leave the husband, like do all that, like that, that may be part of the work for sure, but you're going to fall right back into the same old patterns. Unless you realize that you've got to train your body to feel safe in something that is actually safe and healthy and functional. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Get yourself used to being treated well or demanding to be treated well. 
and treating yourself well, not just from other people, but demanding to treat yourself well, you know? And, and I, I don't think it, it took me not only therapy, it took me doing research and a ton of reading on my own. It took me dating in my forties, which was a disaster, but yet (laughs) wonderful at the same time, because each disaster taught me something else that for me to finally figure out that, you know, the only thing that really mattered was how I felt about me and whatever situation that I have myself in, it's important to like the, to, to like me in it. Right. You know, and right. and I had to do whatever I could to make sure that I really was comfortable with myself. Yeah. You know, metaphorically standing naked in the sunshine, I was comfortable with myself. Yeah. You know, and that took yeah. a lot of work and a lot of digging deep and a lot of journaling, which I've been doing for 30 years. And, and uh, I would uh, just get out of get your own way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people don't even know they're in their own way. I think it's everyone else's fault. Yeah. But I mean, ultimately you're the only person who's responsible for you. And when you, when you take that radical self-responsibility where you are, where you're like, I mean, because let's be honest, chances are whatever happened to you was not your, your choice. Right. Right. Like chances are like whatever happened, especially if you were a kid, you couldn't leave. You couldn't say no, you couldn't fight back. Like your autonomy was not respected that was not your choice. And that certainly was not your fault. Right. Right. But as a, a fully adult sovereign autonomous being, what you choose to do with that absolutely is your responsibility. Yeah. And you can live in victimhood forever and be like, Oh, it wasn't my fault. Well, I didn't choose this. Like, Oh, it was done to me. I mean, you can live like that and it's true. You didn't choose it. And it wasn't fair for sure. But after a while, you know, you're 30 years old. Right. Uh, it happened to me when I was a kid. I didn't choose this doesn't fly anymore. Exactly. Yeah. Because and that's you're 30 you years to- old and you woke up this morning and you did that same thing that you've done for 30, 30 years. <laughs> yeah. It is now your choice. Yeah. Yeah. And and so like what I find is people who have those like sudden wake up calls where they're like, fuck, I've got to take some responsibility for myself. Mm -hmm. They take the responsibility for themselves, but then it's a process of coming back to, or discovering for the first time how to trust themselves. Yes. Because they've been so used to outsourcing their power, their decision-making, their beliefs, their feelings, their like everything to things and people outside of themselves. And so you can't just tell somebody, well, just take responsibility for yourself without also helping them them, giving them cultivate that, that sense of self-trust, you know, because once you trust yourself, like, fuck the, the, it's limitless. Yeah. You know, there isn't anything now that I wouldn't try or do if I felt like it was in my own best interest to do. Yeah. You know, and then it was a healthy thing. There was a a movie a bunch of years ago called um, Letters to Juliet with, um, I can't think of a single name of any of the actors. I (laughs) I haven't seen it. (laughs) It's so good. Um, Basically, you don't even need to know the premise, but there was a scene where they're talking about the phrase, what if? Mm -hmm. And, you know, this, this one woman allowed what if to scare her. But what if it was a disaster? What if my parents mm-hmm. disown me? What if the relationship combusts? What if, what if, what if, what if? And used it as a way to limit herself. Yeah. And it really spoke to me because it was really 100% the way my mother lived her life and why mm-hmm. she was always so miserable. And it really was part of the, the template that she was trying to raise me with. Yeah. This, this fear and anxiety and, you know, well, and nothing works out and, and nothing works out wrong. and everything's yeah. against you and everything's horrible. Yeah. And what if the sky falls, you know, and what if, what if the, the earth swallows you up whole, you know, like none of the things that would happen. Mm-hmm. And even if half of them happened, we'd be fine. You know, we could figure yeah. it out a way to be resourceful enough to figure it out. But for me, I saw what if as an option, as a, as a, mm-hmm. an optimistic thing. Well, yeah. what if it worked out? What if yeah. I learned something great? What if I tried it and I loved it? What if I was really good at it? What if me doing that thing or going to that place or talking to that person, what if that opened up a whole new conduit to something that I'd never even imagined before? 
Yeah. You know? And what if I tried it and I hated it? So what? What would happen? So what? <laughs> I do it again and I change my mind and I try something else. Yeah. You know? um, and it, it sort of harkened back to a lesson that I, I taught myself when I was 14. I had grown up sort of being painfully shy. And my mom, who had been shy, was like limited her whole life because she was afraid of what other people would think about her. So she didn't open her mouth and say anything and she didn't go anywhere and she was miserable about it and yet didn't see that it was within her, within her power to change. And at 14, I was like, well, that's just bullshit. I don't want to live my life that way. Nice. You no, know, I want to try out for the school musical. I want to be friends with those kids over there. I want to, you know, whatever. And and I, 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 I wrote in my journal, I actually remember looking at myself in the mirror and saying, okay, so if you talk to those kids on the other side of the cafeteria, what is going to happen? Will the earth crack open and swallow you whole? Will a fiery bolt of lightning from the sky come down and burn you to a crisp? No, nothing will happen. The worst that will happen is that they don't want to talk to you and they spurn you in some way. Could you live with that? Yes, because it can't be worse than being ignored, right? Yeah. So I got up the courage and I went over and I talked to them and they laughed at the thing I said, which was supposed to be a joke, so it was fine. And, and it was great. And I can't say that we became the best of friends because I don't even know who they were. I have no recollection of what they looked like or who, you know, what their names were. I just know that they existed and that the event happened. And it made me feel like, all right, well, I could do that. I can trust myself to survive that. What else can I do? You know, That's it was just like a, a lightning <laughs> bolt. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. I don't even know. I don't even know if my 17 year old could do that. I just, I just turned myself on that way, you know, That's like amazing. this is what I have to do. And then I'm like, I, I really, you know, I want to be on stage with the show at school, the musical. I don't want to just do publicity. I don't want to just build sets or whatever I wanted. And I knew I could sing if I would ever get the gumption to actually sing in front of another, in front of another human being. And so I used that same, what if, what if it went well, then I'd be in the show. What if it went really badly? What would happen? Yeah. Not a goddamn thing. It's a closed <laughs> audition. None of my friends would see me. No one else would hear. And the worst comes to worst. I don't get in the show and I go back to the publicity committee. Like, yeah. wow. There was no downside. That's incredible that you had that, um, that thought process at such a young age. That's really, really brave. And I, I don't, thank you. And I don't know. I mean, cause that's way before the movie thing, but, um, <laughs> but, but I don't, I don't know what, what triggered it. I can't. I mean, I think it was think... just not wanting to be like the way my mother was. Yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes seeing the, the trajectory that we could be on if we, if we stayed in the familiar, you know, in what right. is safe air quotes, what's safe, but maybe not functional or healthy or is chaotic. Like it's like a Christmas story, you know, like, yeah. And you're can... just like, well, I'm fuck that. Like, that's not an option for me. Right. I'm going <laughs> to yeah. do whatever I can to learn how to be something else to do yeah. the exact opposite of that. That's exactly what I did whenever I got out of the psych hospital. I'm, yeah. I'm going to do whatever I can to figure out what got me to this place. And then, and then I'm, and then I'm going to heal, heal all of it. it. Right. <laughs> and the I'm only still way out is through. It. Yeah. Right. It, and I'm still we're not done. healing it. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people think it's like a one and done thing. The whole. No. But it's not. It's okay. I feel this. Now what else do I heal? And then you may have to go back and still excavate something that you thought you were done with, but maybe you weren't, you know, yeah. it's sort of a never ending process, but, but it's not daunting. I think once you start, and you start to feel better and you start to recover some of your own personal agency and your own faith in yourself and 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 feel that connection to the to the spiritual realm or whatever you mm -hmm. call that i think when you start living into your own power i think it's it's addicting in a good way you know yeah you well more. how do you how do you eat an elephant one bite at a freaking time <laughs> <laughs> i mean and we're we're right. so used to either living in the past or projecting into the future. What if, what if, what if, right? That's all future projection, right? You know, and then we limit ourselves because of our past. So it's like, well, this didn't work out in the past. Therefore I'm not going to try it again. So, okay. That's a great recipe for stuckness, right. right? That's a great recipe for stuckness, but you don't have to 
look in the future or in the past, you can literally just one moment at a time, one hour at a time, one day at a time. Like Mm -hmm. that's how I got. Yep. And then the next right thing. And then the next right thing. You just have to do the next right thing. You don't have to plan 10 steps down the road. You just have to take the next step. Yeah. Mindfulness puts you right in the moment. Baby steps are still steps. Yep. (laughs) I tell my (laughs) students that all the time. Baby steps are still steps. Yeah. Yeah. I bet you're a great teacher. I try. I try. Today, this year, I'm looking at everything, you know, it's 18, 20 months into a pandemic. I'm looking at all the literature that I teach that we read together from a mental health standpoint. Mm. You know, not just this is a dynamic character and he changed because of it, but why? You know, mm. what was it about what happened to him, his experience, the way he grew up, the times that he lived in? that made this character make this choice? And and what were the ramifications of that? And how did that, you know, how did he feel in that moment? How do you know how he felt in that moment? And then it's it's close reading and it's emotional literacy. And I'm I'm hoping so far the kids are taking to it very well. And and some of them more than others, because you know, everything is a is a lovely bell curve. Um but some of the kids are, are really, their writing is starting to develop more of a sense of their own understanding of their own brains, which is nice. the ultimate goal of every freaking thing I ever do. Yeah. So <laughs> it's heavenly. Well, this has been a lovely conversation. Oh, Lindsay. amazing. I did, so, I, did I answer all your questions? <laughs> you answered all my questions. You know, for the, for the first time in a while, I didn't pre-prepare a whole list of stuff, a list of questions, because I, I knew that it would just happen organically and be great. So Amazing. That's my favorite. Awesome. So I will link all of your contact information, you know, your website and your Instagram and your socials and all of that Thank stuff you. to the show notes, as well as the links to some of the books that you have recommended. Um, so if you're not driving, you can scroll down and look at the show notes. If you are driving while you're listening to this or walking in traffic, please don't look at the show notes. Yeah. <laughs> you, I, you know, I was, in a, I was in a coffee shop the other day and... I literally saw someone on a bicycle, like looking at their phone while they were riding a bike. And I was just a recipe for death. How do you even do that? Like, I don't even think I would have the coordination to be able to do that. No, but that's gotta be worse than looking at your phone while you're driving. I, yeah, I think that looking at your phone while you're riding a bike is probably worse than looking at your phone while you're driving. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Not good. Yikes. Yeah, man, these stupid phones. And yet mine's never more than five feet away from me. Right. Mine is right here in front of me. <laughs> totally. I had to, I had to text my husband while we were talking to tell him to put the chicken in the oven for dinner. <laughs> okay. There you go. How are we cooking the chicken? I mean, baking it, but with what? Okay. So we have a seasoning mix that my husband made up. We call it the season anything spice blend. Um, but it's like paprika it has a lot of paprika in it paprika salt pepper garlic powder um what uh I think there's some oregano in there um anyway he he makes it in like quart size jars he like makes wow. these big batches of it and then we just have the jar and I buy uh skin on bone in chicken thighs Okay. And we generously sprinkle that seasoning mix over the chicken thighs and, and just then bake, bake it. it at 375 for like 40, 45 minutes, the skin gets super crispy Uh and it has that crispy spice coating on it. Nice. And then the juices mix with the spice coating. So it makes this, it's not like a gravy or a sauce, but it's like, I don't know. It's just delicious. It's one of our favorite things to make. I mean, we love to make chicken thighs with the season, anything spice mix on it. Nice. So that's what's for dinner. (laughs) And he can make it on his own. (laughs) Uh Fabulous. Yes. Praise the gods. When my husband makes dinner, it's takeout or reservations. So yeah, yeah. usually, usually my husband will like go to, cause we live pretty far out in the woods. So you don't just go get takeout. Like right. it, it, that doesn't it take some thought here. into liberation. Yeah. 
Well, and unfortunately, I'm sure Uber drive. Eats or Grubhub don't deliver to your house. Uh, no, no. Instacart right. does not exist here. Um, yeah, right. you don't just get takeout. Like you drive 45 minutes for takeout if you want. But at that wow. point, you could just like stay in the restaurant and eat. Yeah, but, it would be yeah. cold by the time you got home anyway. Right. So he normally like he will go to the local little general store that we have and he'll get like frozen pizza or that's usually his idea of cooking, which I appreciate. Um, yeah. that's not ideally how I would love to eat, but beggars can't be choosers. And so, right. um, but tonight he can make the chicken and then I have, you know, broccoli or parsnips or like something that I can go throw into, and then we can have dinner. Sounds heavenly. I'm kind of hungry now. <laughs> Same. <laughs> Well, I hope you enjoy your dinner. Thank you so much for being on Permission to Heal. It's been really a delight to chat with you. Thank you, Marcy. I've loved it. Okay, don't go anywhere. I'm not. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Permission to Heal. I hope you found it moving and inspirational. Please remember, you don't need anyone else's permission to trust and follow your heart. You have the power within you. Subscribe to Permission to Heal so you don't miss any new episodes, and please share this with your friends.